morning. Good morning, everybody, um, and welcome to Short Form Social Content, this webinar brought to you by The Space. I'm Linda Coburn, and I'm the moderator today. So I'm going to start by giving you a quick overview of how we'll work and what's going to happen. Um, first off is a quick Zoom round how we use Zoom. So you are all on uh, mute and with your videos turned off because we, uh, we have such a big audience, that's really the, the most sensible way we've found to cope. That's the first thing. The second thing is that we're using both the Q&A and the chat functions today. So chat is what you're, you're already all saying hello and a welcome and greeting each other. And so that's for talking amongst yourselves. And you'll see that Claire from the space team and our tech support people are on line on chat as well so if you've got um, any questions about the process and what's happening um, use chat for those and that saves the Q&A function for when you want to ask questions of our speakers who I'll introduce you to in a minute um, and our, so that if you have um, short quick questions so for example somebody uses some jargon that's not clearly understood drop that quickly into Q&A and one of our speakers will answer those quick questions as we go along. And if you've got more extensive questions, then we'll save those for the, the sections for Q&A between the talks. So we've designed the, the webinar so that they're quite short talks and lots of time for interaction with you, our audience, and be between our audience and our panellists. Um, and uh, then the third thing to note is that we are we have a live captioner with us today so if captions would be useful to you and she is fantastic and amazing and keeps up brilliantly if the captions are useful to you go to the closed caption option at the bottom of your screen and you can f follow the captions um, which leads me on to the fourth point which is we then record the whole webinar with the captions which you can have a copy of afterwards uh, to look at. And um, in that, the chat is recorded in the recording, but it's all anonymized so that you don't appear on the recordings. Um, and so that's really how we use Zoom. But going back to the questions, um, we, it's a fantastic to have so many people here today and we've allowed as much time as we can for Q&A, um, not only what comes up for you in the moment, but also We've taken looked at all the questions that you sent in in advance, and we'll be putting I'll be putting those to the panelists as we go through. Um, so we really are focusing on the creation of short form social content, and and really and what makes for great content. And what that means is within the time allowed, there are some things, some areas that you've asked about already that we really don't have time to um, answer. But we've got other links and resources that will be useful. So the things that we're not covering in any detail today are rights, but we have another rights webinar coming up on the 10th of June, so you can sign up for that. Um, we won't be going into great detail about platforms, you know, which platform is best for X or Y content, but um, we will also have another distribution webinar coming up in June, date still to be confirmed, but that would be an opportunity to really investigate platforms and also in amongst the links that we send to you there's lots of fantastic uh, documentation which is looking at different platforms the pros and cons of each one accessibility is also something that we don't have an expert here on today um, we'll make reference to it but again included in the links uh, Jo Verint who is an accessibility champion fantastic and um, also on the space board she's written an article really looking at how you can make your content truly accessible and we'll send that to you um, and the fourth thing that people have asked about that we're not covering today is live streaming of sort of full-length performances but again we've got um, uh, a toolkit and a guide about live streaming which we'll send and the, the distribution workshop that's coming up in June we'll also cover some of the platforms and considerations for getting full length pieces of work out to an audience and um, just the last thing to note really on that is that um, what we are talking about today is um, you know video and audio content and images but we're not going to show clips or listen to clips because we know that your broadband may not be up to it so what we'll do is um, send 
links. There's a lot of stuff to come out afterwards. Send links that, uh, so that you can look at and listen to content in your own time. And, um, and the last thing that we'll send out is the, um, the PowerPoint, uh, the slides, so you don't have to frantically write notes or do screen grabs as you're going along. So that's really how it's all going to work. And then the next thing is to introduce you to the people who you will be hearing from today. We've got three speakers and hopefully we can get them all up on video. So I'll get them to wave to you if we can see them all. So the first person you can see is Craig. So Craig's actually our third speaker. This is Craig Bush and he's an associate with the space. And then you can see Rob Lindsay. So Rob, would you like to wave hello? Rob is... Um, head of audiences with the space and he'll be our first speaker today he's going to introduce the other two tell you a bit more about what they'll be doing and our third speaker who's actually in the middle of our program is katie connolly who's another associate with the space okay so they they, they will and i will be uh, throwing your questions to them and then you'll hear from each of them and at the end the, whatever time we have left at the end um, will be a panel with all three so just as much time to answer as many questions as possible Okay, and with that, I'm going to hand over to Rob, who will introduce you to the space and then tell you a little bit about the context of all of this. Thanks, Rob. You'll need to unmute and then away you go. Brilliant. Thanks, Linda. That's great. Um, so, yes, welcome everybody to this webinar. Um, I'd like to kick off by just explaining a little bit about the space. So, as you can see on screen here, we are the UK's digital commissioning and development agency uh, for the arts and the creative sector. Uh, we were originally set up by the Arts Council and the BBC in order to help um, arts organisations connect their fantastic digital content to the audiences that they so deserve. Uh, we have, as you can see, commissioned more than 200 digital projects in four years um, with uh, online and broadcast audience reach exceeding 27 million sessions and over 600 organisations accessing our support. It's really important in everything that we do that we provide learning, that we leave people in a better position than they were than when we first met. Um, so yeah, this webinar again will be another example of that. All right. Um, I am going to talk a little bit about, again, yeah, about what we're going to experience. Uh, as shown on the slide at the start, you're going to hear three speakers today and each of us is going to talk from a slightly different perspective. First of all, uh, I'm going to talk you through a few definitions as well as discussing the current climate and the impact that COVID-19 has had on short form, on organisations publishing short form and of course on audiences as well. Uh, Katie is then going to talk through some of the principles of what makes for effective short form content, um, providing you with some really practical takeaways that will hopefully improve the responses that you get to the material that you publish. Um, and finally, Craig is going to share some practical tips surrounding workflows and tech suggestions taken into account that we're all working from home with all of the creative and technical restrictions that that entails. Just to summarize, just in case you missed what I just said, um, I'm gonna talk through some definitions and the current climate that we're in and the impact that COVID-19 has had on short form. Katie will talk through some practical takeaways and the principles of what makes effective short form content. And finally, Craig is going to talk through practical tips on workflows and tech. Um, I should say as well, there will be a chance to ask questions after each speaker. Um, I know that Linda's already sourced some questions from some of the most frequently asked that we've had over the past couple of weeks since we put this webinar um, up and also we'll stay on the end for a wider discussion group too. The other thing that I want to flag is as well is that um, anyone that is sharing slides you'll see that when we do share the slides the zoom window on your screen will maximize so if any of you are taking notes on your screen through notepad or text editor or anything like that uh, once the screen has expanded you'll be able to then um, reduce it back down again and continue so just to flag that don't panic. Um, so I'm going to talk a little bit about some definitions and obviously talk about the importance of short form. Um, I can clearly everybody here recognises that, hence the fact we're all here. But yeah, it is really, really important at the moment with short form allowing you to maintain your profile at a very, very difficult time to maintain visibility um, and also to tell the story of your organisation through a series of 
smaller modular points, all of which do allow jumping on points for audiences, all of which do allow you to, um, to, to be shared by your audience as well. It allows them to evangelize about you, it allows them to be ambassadors for you as well. Um, lots of us are very complex in what we offer to audiences as organizations. So short form allows us to build up that picture gradually. Again, you'll hear more about this throughout the day. But first of all, I thought it would be useful to talk through what we mean by short form social content. We're going to focus today on some of the content types that come uh, with the greatest challenges, the greatest technological challenges, strategic challenges, challenges of format and optimization. But beyond today, I'd really like to, you to consider that short form content doesn't have to refer exclusively to the running time of a piece of audio or a piece of video. It can instead be useful to think of short form in terms of audience experience. What I mean by this is that it's worth also including in your thinking anything that engages quickly with audiences for a short period of time, particularly something that allows for a simple shareable post on social media. So that might include a blog post, a piece of writing that takes three minutes to read, or a gallery of 10 images on Facebook that takes 60 seconds to skim through before choosing your favorite. Or Barnsley Museum's popular online jigsaw puzzles, which you can find on their various Twitter accounts. Or the Tower of London's Twitter-based Choose Your Own Adventure from last October, which I know a number of you will have seen. The ease of engagement and the simplicity with which something can be shared by your audience is just as important as the format itself or the media you choose. Successful short form can be shared individually through social media. As I said, making ambassadors of those who see it, like it and pass it forward. They offer a number of entry points for new audiences to discover your organisation. For those of you who do ask what the ideal length of time is for a piece of short form, whatever format it is, I'd always recommend approaching your content as if it were a joke or a speech or a press release. Keep it as lean as possible in service of the story you're telling and make sure that the payoff justifies the time that the audience have spent with you. Really try and avoid tangents and distractions. Keep everything in service of that story. And if you have to remove elements that you like, you can save them and create a new piece of content later. Finally, I'd like to talk very briefly about the current climate and the impact that it is having on short form. There's certainly a lot of short form at the moment. Uh, a lot of what I'm about to describe, you'll, you'll have seen your own examples of, but I will give some. It's important, first of all, to recognize the restrictions on ourselves in what we can produce and how. Technology is limited and we need to manage our own expectations too. We've potentially moved from offices with company Wi-Fi, both in terms of download and upload speeds. And a lot of us are now dealing with domestic restrictions where the bandwidth isn't quite as high. We're working with different levels of technology. We're working with different types of kit. But crucially, audience expectations have also changed considerably. Everybody is aware of these global restrictions and their own focus is now on access rather than polish. This provides everybody with an invaluable time to experiment. Personalities, candidness and access are all doing fantastically well with audiences. From Joe Wick's PE lessons, to the Royal Ballet's dance classes, to US talk shows, doing their shows from their homes, from their kitchens, with their partners as their camera operators and their children doing the graphics. In all of these instances, People are appreciating the fact that people are reaching out, that people are sharing, that people are still maintaining a presence online. Again, it's that candidness, that access, that truth. New audience take-ups have also improved with older communities now using Facebook, Zoom and audio platforms simply to keep in touch with families, but also to stay connected to wider community offerings like church services or uh, library offerings. This has resulted in organizations now having access to audiences that were previously considered hard to reach, audiences that weren't previously available to us digitally. For a lot of these reasons, it's therefore really, really important for us to think sustainably at this time as well. We recommend this irrespectively. We at The Space, we recommend this irrespectively of the current situation. Make your content work hard for you beyond this time. 
this might be that you're making fantastic evergreen content that you can continue to use in, in three years time. Or it might be that the processes of putting that content together allow you to build internal workflows that allow you to build internal communication structures and agreements within your organization that mean sudden new types of content are available to you. Equally, it could simply be that the research and the fact checking that you put into telling your stories at the moment can be used for assets now and can be used for assets in the future. Um, I'm going to leave it at that. We'll go into some more specific details. And I know, Linda, you've got a couple of questions too. Yeah. So um, I know that Claire's already invited you to ask questions, use the Q&A questions for Rob at this early stage. Um, and I've picked up on some of the things that we were asked in advance, uh, one of which was about quality. How, how do you measure quality? And particularly in the light, you know, you've been saying, that at the moment the audience is more forgiving. So what are, what are our standards here? Um, I mean, I'd really, I think some of the most striking ones are a number of the US talk shows who are doing interviews over Skype or Zoom, who are genuinely do not have lighting rigs and audiences anymore. I'd really encourage you to have a look at Jimmy Kimmel, have a look at Jimmy Fallon, have a look at those shows. Um, you can find clips of them on YouTube. Um, they are still delivering a lot of material in the same way. They are leaving applause breaks, even though there is no audience. Uh, they are talking directly to camera. They often have children running around at their feet as well. Um, they're a really interesting case study to have a look at. And I suppose within the arts, looking at the work of orchestras who might previously have not been allowed into the orchestra pit if they were wearing white reflective socks and now all of a sudden are able to be at home in the conservatory on a wonderful sunny day like this, performing solos in, in summer clothes. So I think there's some really kind of key examples there. And again, you know, a lot of what you're seeing everywhere, there is there has been a reduction in quality. People are streaming online, people are using the, the cameras on laptops and phones and so forth. So yeah, there's a number of examples out there. The thing that is crucial is what is actually being said, what is being presented what is being offered to the audience really. Um, and actually, so I've just noticed that in um, chat, somebody's putting in another example and saying lots of big brands are using Zoom for TV ads. So, we'll yes. share, so it would be to say to the audience, wh wh what are the good quality, really good quality um, examples of content that you've seen recently? Just to, that's a chat that's carrying on as we, as we talk. That's um, and, and another question that we've been asked, is about was about trends what what's really cutting through what have you noticed about shifts in the last couple of months in terms of so engaging social content um particularly in the arts world i think it's become very personality driven so again if we take an example of a uh, an orchestra that might have had 50 60 70 players all of a sudden just one of them can come and create a very compelling piece of content that might be playing it might be talking it might be interviewing someone else over Skype um, but there's that kind of access to individuals I think it's the same with curators as well I know a lot of museums um, the museum sector was fantastic in its kind of initial responses um, obviously knowing that they had stories that they could suddenly make available as well um, so I think a lot of those are working well I think across the board I think the thing that really makes something sing is um, first impressions really I think making sure that irrespective of the visual or the audio quality, um, the things that we might, the, the production quality that we might normally look at um, and assess. Um, I think it's just making sure that actually what is being offered is engaging and is interesting, really. I think there is curiosity from audiences again. So this period of experimentation we're in, I think audiences will, um, you know, give you a few extra moments to, to explain what it is that you're offering. Um, but I think, yeah, that is still hugely, hugely important. And the things that are doing well are the pieces that, that know what it is they're offering and kind of get on with it, really. And we have had a question that really follows on from that, which is um, asking, how do you balance the lower quality elements of making work now with making it evergreen? Yeah, I think that's, I think that's really, really important. I think a lot of us are in a few years' time there is going to be this, this huge swathe of content that was clearly created under a different circumstance. 
just as the television writers strike of 10, 15 years ago resulted in lots of TV series only being half as long and things like that. Um, I think there will be that. I think, to be honest, um, I think have a think about the stories that you're telling. I think that, yeah, there will be a lot of media that is recorded under these circumstances that people will refer back to. I suspect it will in many ways become normalized. It will be accepted that this was simply the, the musical recording that was made remotely, or this was the um, interviews that were conducted over Skype. Um, I think that element of it will become normalized. And I think, yeah, even in the future, I think people will accept that when they look back on it. I think what's really, really crucial is if all, if all of our content keeps referring to COVID, if all of our content keeps talking about what we're experiencing now, um, that's something that would date it in the same way that it would date it irrespective of the quality of the content. I think if you can try and make compelling stories, compelling material, um, without acknowledging COVID more than you have to really, um, then I think that will still be, that will make it very, very, very valuable in the future. I hope that makes sense. It does indeed. And it feels like a very good point at which we will bring in Katie, Katie Connolly, Space Associate, who's our second speaker, who's really going to look at two things, isn't she? she Katie's going to be looking at the, some of the thinking you do beforehand and then into giving some practical tips when you're creating content. Have we got Katie? There you are. OK, OK. Here you go. OK, Hello. Katie, over to you. Thanks, Rob, and thanks, Linda. Good morning, everybody. Um, yeah, following on from what uh, Rob's been talking about, I'm going to talk today um, about some things that you can think about when actually creating short form content. So that's going to include some things to think about before you actually get started. And then I'm going to run through some quite practical advice around creating your content, which should hopefully help it to actually cut through on what are quite noisy, crowded um, social media and digital channels. So I'm just going to share some slides with you quickly. Um, and as Rob talked about the definitions of short form content and for the purposes of what I'm talking about today, um, this is kind of what I'm going to be referring to, which is either video, image or audio content. Now short form is traditionally a term that refers to video, but a lot of the principles that I'm talking about today, probably all of the things I'm going to talk about today can be applied to images and audio as well. Um, now at this point, it's easy to feel quite overwhelmed with the number of different options you have available to you for creating a piece of content that could go out on social and digital channels. And this is one of the reasons why it can feel so overwhelming because um, across these channels, there are lots of different options from Facebook videos to quote and images on Instagram to podcasts. Um, it can feel like there are an infinite number of options and just so many different things that you could do. And now this leads me into the first thing that I would advise you do before you even get started with making anything, which is to focus your efforts and just choose one. Um, really give yourself permission to not do absolutely everything. Choose one of these things and hone it and get really good at it. And you will have a far greater chance of success than you would spreading your efforts and spreading your resources across lots of different types of content. So that would be the first piece of advice would be to um, to just give yourself permission to focus. I can see that Linda's. Um, I just wanted to ask you if you could explain what a quote, a quote image is and an audio. Of course. No. Yes, of course. So, yeah, those are sort of different examples of um, the types of uh, content that you might see on social media channels. So when I say a quote image there, you might have seen them if you have an Instagram account or if you follow any, anybody on Instagram, you might see this become a bit more of a popular format. It's a way people might put quotes either by themselves or by other people. It's essentially just text written on, um, on normally on like a square image. So you see poets using it a lot, um, authors use it as well. So that's what I remember the quote image. An audiogram is normally what we're referring to um, is if you have some audio that's been overlaid either on an image or a simple video um, and then put out on a channel such as Instagram or Facebook. So that's normally what we're referring to. So a, a different way of sharing audio other than via a podcast platform. 
Does that make sense? Fantastic. Okay, so just the next couple of things to think about before you actually get started. The next one would be is to think about your audience. This is really important. Um, you need to ask yourself, who is this for and why do they care? Um, it can be quite easy as an organisation. Um, and I know I'm guilty of this as well, having worked within organisations, um, to only think about the story that you want to tell but it's really important to get into the head of the people that you're trying to reach and work out what story do you have to tell that can connect with them? What kind of stories are they watching online at the moment and what are they engaging with? What do you have that can sort of fulfill some kind of need that they might have, particularly at the moment? Um, they might need escapism, they might need connection, they might need resources for uh, educating their kids at home. Always put yourself in the position of the audience and persistently question yourself, why would they care about this? It's really important now and always to use those people that you're trying to connect with as your starting point for your content. And then the third thing to think about is to work with what you've got. So resources are pressured now and quite a lot of the time, generally. Um, it can be useful to just look at what you have at your disposal that can be a jumping off point for creating some content that's going to connect with those audiences that you want to reach. So that might be an archive of really interesting images that you could overlay some audio over. You might have a YouTube channel with lots of still relevant videos that you could get reformatted for Facebook or Instagram. What you may have is a company of really willing, enthusiastic performers who are happy to film themselves at home and an editor that you know well or some editing software in which case that could be a good jumping off point for filming some content remotely. But try to make life easy for yourselves and look at what you've got at your disposal that can be that jumping off point. So those are the things to think about before you get started. Um, I'm gonna go on to some slides again and talk through five, um, five kind of practical tips for actually creating your content that should hopefully help it cut through. And the first one of these is to format your content for the channel that it's going out on. Um, this is really crucial and far, far easier to think about this at the beginning of the process of creating your content than it is at the end when you have a finished portrait or a finished video file or a finished audio file. It's far easier to think about this at the start. And the examples we've got on the screen at the moment from all from the same publisher, we've got um, a Facebook video formatted square on the left hand side. In the middle, we have a portrait Instagram video with the graphics overlaid at the top. And then on the right hand side, we have a, a YouTube video in that more traditional landscape format, but with those uh, quite recognisable thumbnails. Now, creating formats for different channels will add editing time, so it is worth either briefing an editor or being aware of that if you're editing yourself, being sure that you're keeping enough time, and enough resource to account for the fact that you're going to be requiring different formats depending on what channel you're going to be publishing on. But this is really crucial because audiences have become accustomed to seeing these different formats on the different channels. And if yours doesn't follow that format, then it can be quite easy for it to be um, dis dismissed and drowned out by the ones that do because audiences eyes have almost become accustomed to seeing these different styles of videos on uh, on these platforms so that's the first one make sure you're formatting your content for the channel the next uh, practical tip is to always lead with your story and to front load now front load is a slightly jargony phrase so I do apologize but I will explain it's really important to get to the heart of your story and to lead with the most impactful part of it as soon as possible. And that's what we mean by front load, is leading with your best, most impactful, most emotive part of what you're talking about as quickly as possible. Um, you're in a race against time on a lot of these channels to get somebody to continue to engage with what you're showing them. So it's really important that you get straight to the heart of why someone would want to continue to watch. Um, and the examples on the screen demonstrate this. So um, on the left-hand side here, we've got um, a project that was a space commission a couple of years ago uh, with Creative Black Country on their 100 Masters project, which celebrated independent artists and creatives in the region. 
And the interesting thing here is that you notice that none of that is mentioned in the Facebook video that went out and the social copy that accompanied it. Really, they've got straight to the heart of what the most interesting part of this story is, which is that Caroline got an ER, um, A level and then went on to become a really successful independent artist. On the right hand side of the screen is a screenshot from a trailer for an immersive theatre production. Um, and that statement, a politician's future hangs in the balance, appears within the first two or three seconds of the video. Um, again, nothing about the production itself, nothing about the style of production, where it's going to be held. We get straight to the heart of one of the key plot points of the story itself. And this is really key in making sure that you're cutting through and grabbing people's attention as quickly as possible. Um, this can be difficult and it can feel counterintuitive in ways because we have to get rid of a lot of what we've learned in the past about the way that we structure things and things that we might have even included in more traditional marketing materials uh, like logos, titles, organisation names, all of those things that we're used to including you kind of have to strip out all of that padding and just get straight to the heart of the story that you're presenting. Um, this next one on the screen is an example from the National Gallery and an example of how the idea of leading with your story and front loading could be applied to images as well. Um, so this is a portrait from the National Gallery, but we don't really have any backstory here. The artist's name isn't mentioned. There's no information on how long it's been in the National Gallery for, where it came from. The first thing they say is, we have interrupted a young man reading. He turns over his shoulders to look at us. So they've got straight to the heart of what they've interpreted as the story behind this piece. And that's a really arresting way to grab somebody's attention and get them to continue to engage far more so than adding any padding around um, the story, the backstory around the piece itself. We want to get straight to the heart of what's interesting about it. The next piece of advice for creating your content is to be concise. Now this follows on from something that Rob was talking about, which is to be really efficient with the point you're trying to make and be wary of how much attention you're asking of people. Um, as Rob said, we quite often get asked what the ideal length is for a Facebook video, for example, and there isn't really a clear answer to that other than be sensible and be efficient with the point that you're trying to make. Um, the examples on screen at the moment, we have an example on the right there from Mixmag who posted this commemorative video when it was 17 years since Daft Punk had released their album Discovery. And I think that video came in at about 58 seconds. Um, the video on the left is one from Buzzfeed, which is um, about a man who is trapped in a haunted ghost town um, and has been stuck there throughout the whole coronavirus pandemic because he's been forced to quarantine there. That one's come in at about eight minutes. So they're very different lengths, but they're different styles of stories. The, the haunted ghost town story, for example, is more um, documentary style. So it's actually quite an involved story, but it's quite one that can hold your attention for quite a, a, a decent amount of time. The Daft Punk video, they've really got one point to make, so it can be made quite quickly in, in under a minute. So just be aware of what you're asking of people in terms of their attention and try to be as efficient as possible. The next practical tip for actually creating your content is to use text and subtitles to account for the fact that a lot of short form social content will be viewed on a mobile device with the sound off. 85% um, of Facebook video is watched without the sound. So these, you might recognize some of these examples that um, become quite a popular way of presenting video, particularly on Facebook, where we get, we're seeing lots of text used on the screen, we're seeing subtitles used. Um, this letterboxing technique particularly is very popular with broadcasters such as the BBC and Channel 4. Um, and what's interesting here is you can see that they're actually using that, um, the text on the screen, as a way to really tell the viewer what that payoff is going to be of watching this video. There's no there's no lead up to a punchline and you're kind of being told what the punchline is going to be in order to draw you in and make you want to continue to watch. So there's, um, there's one with Joe Lysett saying it's the best way to deal with a scam and Alan Partridge meets a feminist. We're not being asked to wait to watch the video to find out what those things are. The text on the screen there is really being used to grab our attention and make us want to continue to watch. Um, and again, this, um, because audiences have become accustomed to seeing 
content like this on these channels, if your content appears and for instance, it doesn't have subtitles that appear on screen straight away, it becomes, it just becomes a bit easier for the audience to scroll past, to pause, to move on to their next video, because you're just making them work that little bit harder than the content that they're seeing around them. And then the fifth and final tip for actually creating your content is to use human faces and stories if you can. Um, human faces and stories work really well on social media channels. Um, at the BBC, one of the rules that the social teams used to apply was to try and get a face on screen within a video within the first three seconds of it starting. Um, and on the screen, there's an example of um, a BBC News, I think it's a Facebook video, and you can see that we're at one second and before the BBC News logo has even completely disappeared, we have a face completely full screen in that video. Um, and that's because uh, we know that humans are attracted to human faces. So it's more likely to grab someone's attention than um, a background shot or some, you know, a shot of landscape. Actually, we're far more likely, our eyes are far more likely to buy the sight of another human face. Um, on the left hand side of the screen, there's an example of the Humans of New York um, Instagram account, hugely popular, hugely successful, based purely on pictures of people and quotes from them. That's all it is. And they've got over 10 million followers on Instagram now. So that really shows the power of what a human story can do. Um, you may not have that, you may not have that at your disposal, but a lot of stories that um, come from arts and cultural organisations do have a human element to them. So if you have that, really try to drill down into it and help it make your content more impactful. So yeah, those are all the things I wanted to run through. Um, just to summarise, before you get started, focus your efforts and give yourself permission to do less, but do it really well. Always remember to think about your audience and ask yourself who, is, who would care about this and why. Um, and work with what you've got. Have a look at what you've got at your disposal that can help you to, as a jumping off point to, for creating your short form. And then when you're making your content, remember to format for the channel that it's going out on. Lead with your story and front load and get really straight to the heart of the most impactful part of your story. Be concise and be efficient with people's time. Use text and subtitles to account for soundless viewing on social media channels and use human faces and stories where you can. And that's everything from me. That's great. Thanks ever so much, Katie. And um, we're going to kick in with questions now. Um, we've already had one question for you. And then if anybody wants to add anything to the Q&A, now is a great point. We we'll start with this first question, which actually... Linda, I'm struggling to hear you. Sorry. Oh, I'm sorry. Can you hear me better now? Yes, yes, I can. Okay. So um, the question that's just been asked, which we were also asked in advance, what is how do you make the decision about which channel or platform to use and therefore how you format your work? That's a really good question. I would look at it from two perspectives. So firstly, again, I would always think about that audience and think about who the people are that you want to reach, where they're most likely to be. However, with caution, um, however, uh, always look at where you already have a good audience base because it's far easier to find new audiences on the channels where you already have an existing one um, rather than starting out on a completely new platform and having to build up your audience base from there. So we, there are, we're in a stage now where we have quite a, a, a number of core social media channels that are being used. There's probably three or four or five different platforms that people can use to put content out on. And really your best asset is your existing audiences. So for instance, if you had a really good um, following on Instagram, but you hadn't tried out Instagram Live or Instagram Stories yet, that might be a good starting point. Like look at how you could expand on the channels that you're already on and you already have that existing audience while keeping in mind, who is it we're trying to reach and is this a good place to find them? Okay. Does that make sense? It does. And um, so I've got this two things really. One is, does, does the same principle apply if we're sort of speaking about video, channels that are really video heavy, aren't we? What about if we were thinking yeah. about podcasts and images? The same, the same, do the same principles apply? 
Absolutely, they, they, they really do, particularly around that idea of leading with your story and trying to be impactful and being efficient with people's time. All of those principles apply to images as well. Images are more difficult. You see with that National Gallery example, it's a lot of image things will be around the framing um and with writing copy and social posts for example um podcasts again you might notice if, if you do listen to podcasts there are different techniques um in place so podcasts will quite often start with a the kind of the most exciting part of that podcast episode as a drop in at the very start of the episode so as the kind of intro they might just clip a very exciting quote from somebody or exciting moment that say like 10, 10 seconds long and use that as the front of their episode. Then they'll follow it up with a more traditional introduction. Then they'll get into the, the rest of the episode. And that's really an example of how that idea of front loading, leading with something impactful applies to audio as well. Okay, lovely. Thank you. And um, there was just something I want to come back to. So there was, somebody's asked a question um, any simple tips on understanding the various formats for different channels? And we talked, didn't we, about um, you had a, a guide and some advice for people. Yes, there's some, there are some really useful um, tools and web pages out there, which I think we're going to send out after today around what the different formats are, the, um, right down into technical specs for the different channels. So if you're briefing an editor, for example, or if you're, creating, if you're editing it yourself, you can really look at what those dimensions are, file sizes, limits um, for all the different channels as well. So yeah, we should be able to send out all that information after, the, after today's webinar. So rather than going into details about- specific Yeah, this, it would go into quite, yeah, it was, yeah. Um, it's probably best to, to go into the detail by looking at those links afterwards, but it's worth keeping those, those things on hand so that you're, you've got them to refer back to. Brilliant, okay. And then, um, you know, going back to, there's a specific question about what if the sponsors, you talked about taking, stripping names and logos and things off, but what if your sponsors want their names and logos on, on your content? What, what would yeah. you be saying to those sponsors? That's a very, very good question, because I think we've all been in the situation before where you know what makes the, the content, unfortunately, isn't always just created in isolation. We have um managers and we have sponsors and we have other people to please as well so yeah it's a really really good question um, and what i would suggest is to just make sure that those come at an appropriate point within your content so if you really do need to include sponsor logos make sure that they're at the end rather than the beginning of your short form content so don't use opening screens but use closing screens instead to include logos if you need to include credits or links then comments on facebook or a reply tweet um, a comment on Instagram, you can actually, they're quite forgiving in terms of the amount of information you can put in there. So particularly on Facebook, if you wanted to make a really impactful um, image post, for example, and you just wanted to include a quote, but you also needed to include a link back to your website, um, using the first comment would be a really good place to do that um, without using up your kind of your prime real estate of where you're trying to get your point across. Okay, lovely. Thank you. Um, so uh, we've we've talked really about you know some of the sort of content questions and one of the questions that we got in advance was about um, somebody saying do you have any examples of really good content plans so going back to the th the pre thinking and you know you had your sort of three key points and your five tips would that be the beginning of a content a good content plan. Um, yes, it could be definitely and I'll definitely advise just giving yourself some points to follow and that would be a good point a stuck i think good starting point for actually creating your content and i think when we're talking about content plans we're then looking at how you then plan out how that content is going to be published so i would use that as your starting point for creating it because that would help you with actually getting started but when you're looking at publishing you're then looking at how you're going to apply those principles into what might be a publishing schedule so i would just look at things like splitting down your audiences looking at your different channels looking at what resources you have available to publish and in whatever format you feel comfortable with looking at how you can then publish it um, you it's worthwhile with content plans being aware of your kind of annual cycle as an organization um, and how that might influence it 
and also looking at things that are going on in the wider world or the particular area of arts or culture that you work in and letting those things influence the kind of publishing element as well but yeah I would use that if I was looking to create some short form content now I would be probably running through that list that I've presented today and then looking at applying that into a publishing schedule uh, after uh, through the creation process. Okay and I just wondered whether Rob sort of think if we were thinking about sort of going back almost to the beginning and thinking about okay well, how do I plan what I'm going to do with content you'll talk about sustainability Rob did, did you have anything you would want to add to that in terms of making a really effective plan? Yeah I mean I think it's uh, we talked a little bit about the beginning about um, making sure that what you create is working as hard as possible for you really um, it may be that you're starting to make a particular type of content because you have got um, audio interviews that you created as part of the research for an exhibition or you've got um, uh, videos of a rehearsal process or you've got photos from your archive or when your venue was first built you know it may be that you are taking advantage of an opportunity that has arisen um, but be really really clear about yeah, who your audience are and how hard can that content work for you? So I mentioned earlier on about this idea about research that you do might be able to inform a written article, but also a video, also a podcast, also you being interviewed on radio as well. You know, if you want to, it can be any number of things. It's, yeah, having a think about um, making sure that the work that you're doing, you're getting as much bang for your buck as possible out of that, really. Does that make sense? It does. Um We've had a, a sort of further question about it. Somebody saying, you know, if you were doing a content plan, could you include a new theme every week? Sort of thinking about, you know, looking at co some connecting with national and international campaigns, which I read it out and then I think that sounds like a lot of work to me. <laughs> <laughs> is, that, could that, is that doable? Could you really do, create, you know, have the energy to do that much? Do a new theme every week? I think, again, if there is scope for your themes to cross over, um, that can be good. You know, I think if you're going to do something that's massively tied to Wednesday, the 20th of May or something, you know, you're not going to be able to, you know, to this week, this moment in time, you've got to wait 12 months to come back to that, you know, um, try and make sure that you're going to be able to, to, yeah, use it as much as possible, really, because yeah, if you make something that's massively tied to that moment, yes, you'll be able to use it again, potentially in 12 months time maybe maybe there's an earlier opportunity to reuse something you know have a think um so an example of this i'll give a practical example because i'm a, i realize i'm sort of talking around the subject if you have um uh, birmingham royal ballet for example uh have made if they're doing a production of swan lake or something like that they might do a video about how one of the tutus is made and um it fits into the iconography of swan lake but they can arguably use that as a video just about Two two construction anytime they want to. So they can use that when Swan Lake comes back. They can use it when it's London Fashion Week. They can use it when it's, I don't know, maybe the summer holidays and people are thinking about what courses to do. You know, there's a number of different times. And it's also quite broad content that in fairness to them they can probably use anytime they want. So yeah, it's worth having a think about about, yeah, kind of trying to load in a couple of themes or a couple of, of topics there. Okay, lovely. Right? So um so we've talked about platforms and we've talked about planning for content and the other sort of area of questions that we've had is um sort of back to katie to start with so you've been talking about what works and top tips for for content that uh is brilliant and but the question then is how do you stand out what how could you make something that feels very different what would be your advice to somebody who wanted to do that um that's a really really good question and i think um sometimes it feels like we're kind of searching for this magic ingredient that is something that will make a piece of content fly um, and get millions of views because it does it's not always clear exactly what that magic thing is and actually that's kind of what i've run through today is it's it's not really a magic ingredient it's lots of small little things that will um contribute to the success of the content and actually they're actually quite unglamorous and uh, not particularly magic sounding at all. It's just really working away at those small details that will make your content as effective as possible. So if you're trying to create something really different, then I would just have a look at what is being produced, particularly in your particular area. Look at the stories that are being told and actually 
look at maybe doing something different to how your um, industry normally presents itself. So actually that example that Rob's just used, that idea of uh, creating some content about Swan Lake by looking at, by making a video about the construction of the tutu, like look at, try to look at things from a completely different angle. And one way that you can do this is to ask yourself, how, why would somebody who has never heard of us who would not otherwise be interested in what we do, what have we got that we can talk to them about? And that really makes, puts you in the, the position of trying to find something really, really unique and really distinctive about a story that you've got to tell. Try and think about the furthest reaching person you would like to reach um, and how you would engage them and what story you would tell to them. And that's how you kind of come to create something really distinctive. Lovely, thank you. Rob, did you have anything to add to that? Um, yeah, I think I think that uh, everyone here is already exactly as Katie said. It's the stories that are unique and, and distinctive. You know, all of us are unique and distinctive. All of us have fantastic, unique organisations with brilliant, insightful, inspiring, informative, beautiful stories. You know, um, I think that what you will often find is that audiences are audiences are sort of getting used to particular formats in the same way that we expect a play to be a particular length or a radio show to be a particular format or something like that. Um, it's difficult to introduce a completely new format to an audience, um, but you can really take advantage of them having already established and learnt, you know, to engage with something in a particular way. So if we look at podcasting or something like that, which is something which had a, a massive, massive surge a couple of years ago, and a lot of people really got into it, it involved its potentially a, a podcasting app or something on your phone there was a little bit of a learning curve but there was enough content in order to make that learning curve worthwhile for a lot of people um a lot of that heavy lifting has been done with that format for example if you're going to try and produce something completely different and completely new you've got to take on that burden of, of educating the audience as to what it is you're offering and how they're supposed to interact with it so yeah i would always say if you want to make something unique and brilliant and um, recognize that you already are unique and brilliant um yeah and just lean into that right. and I, I was really noticing that when you were saying that you could choose to take on the burden of educating the audience that katie was really nodding along so i guess yeah, yeah some resonance there and yeah. katie is a last question to you before we introduce craig our third speaker um, somebody has asked and it's a kind of follow-on to the idea of um you know what would you do with your material she, she says, how easy would it be to use the audio of a virtual discussion like this into a podcast and use short clips for social promotion? She's thinking about maximising the impact and reach of one single event. Yeah, absolutely. I think that I think it would be very easy. And I think that leads nicely probably on some of the stuff that Craig's going to talk about, which is actually the practicalities around doing this kind of thing remotely and um, then converting it into short form social but absolutely and that is one of the main things main ways we recommend using audio is um, clipping it out reversioning reversioning for the different channels it can actually be some of the simplest short form social content that you make which is overlaying some audio over an image for example and if you look at um, these will be quite developed examples but if you look at some of the most popular podcasts you'll see the techniques that they use. If you go and look at their Instagram feeds, for example, you'll see the techniques that they use in how they overlay audio clips over text or images to create some very nice short form content, which effectively then acts as the promotion for the podcast itself. So yeah, absolutely. You've hit on a technique that a lot of, a lot of those big podcasts are using and it's a, it's a very simple thing to create. And I think Craig will probably be able to give some insights into the actual the tools that are available to use to do that yeah lovely thank you and again just a question to our audience would be what examples have you seen out there of pe people using uh, audio and video really inventively in, in in ways that reflect who they are brilliantly and we'll if you have good examples that you love we can add all of those into the links and then share them out with 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 everybody who's participating today okay that's fab thank you very much um, we have had one other question in which I'm going to leave because I think I'll leave it to the end. It's about uh, donations on social platforms. So let's let's come back to that one. But for now, um, thank you to Katie. And we're going to hand over to Craig, Craig Bush, who's our third speaker. But 
just before we do that, I want to uh, say what, what we've really heard so far is both Rob and Katie talking about some of the thinking behind all of this, you know, what do you need to put in place? What do you need to consider before you start making content? And Craig is really looking at, as Katie said, some of the practical things that you can do to make your video content really work brilliantly. So there's obviously a place in between that, which is storytelling. And um, we're not covering that today because we recognize that you as arts organizations know your stories inside out. You'll know what you want to tell. And also in whatever medium you already work, you're brilliant at storytelling. So we're assuming that's a given. And Craig is really thinking, all right, you've got your story. How, what can you do to give it some real polish or work as social content? Thanks, Craig, over to you. Good morning. Uh, am I coming through clear? Fantastic. So my name is Craig Bush. I'm a video producer director with TAC Productions. I'm a specialist in video for arts, culture and heritage sectors. And I'm just going to pull up my slides here. So I'll just share that up. There we go. Ooh, excuse me. There we go. Okay. So we're going to look at some ways of being resourceful and creating video in a lockdown. We don't have a lot on our hands. We may not be able to commission people, but we're going to look at way of getting stuck in and getting hands on if you are going to create your own content. So there's going to be a few key areas that we're covering today. These are planning, filming, audio and editing and then very quickly at the end i'll after the slides i'll demonstrate a couple of these more practical features rather than jumping in and out there's just a couple of things i've done around me which i can showcase some of the things that i've been discussing okay so first with planning i cannot emphasize enough how your best tool is planning this will be the key to realizing what is possible for any project but particularly during this lockdown i want you to think about what you want Consider your constraints and we can creatively solve your problems. Okay, just with some of the things, some of the equipment that you have around you. Some of the things that I want you to think about uh, I want you to think about how, where, and when is going to be filmed. Um, so that includes the kit that is available to you, uh, that includes the space that you've got to film in and the availability of it. I'm sure some of you are sharing the house with your partner or kids. So think about how you're gonna work around that. Then think about the time of day. What gives you the best light in your rooms and what is least intrusive to your audio recordings? Now, when you think about how it's gonna be put together, are you using pre-existing assets that you need to gather together? If so, are multiple people supplying and transferring content to each other? Are you mixing audio and visual? You need to have a think about how and when you're gonna be bringing these together. I'm going to make some assumptions. You're watching this live. So for some basic kit, I'm going to assume that you have a smartphone or tablet or a laptop as well. And for people who want to get a bit more advanced, I'm going to give you some tips as well for people who have got computers capable of media editing or maybe buying in some more complementary equipment. So first off, we're going to look at filming. Uh, the most important basic thing is looking for light in your house. Check where the light comes in. This will give you the best results as your camera won't have to work as hard to boost the image. You can support that with any lights from your home to brighten things. So make the most of the lamps that you have to hand. Okay, just scatter them around, boost up your image. Check your framing. Do you have anything that you don't want to people to see in shot? Another thing you should consider is whether your performer can be clearly seen against the background. So make the use of contrasting colors of both performer and background, if you have them. Experiment with your camera, right? Get to grips with the settings and watch some tutorials online that are specific to using your camera's features. Things like autofocus and auto exposure. These settings can throw up surprises when you're filming. So just get used to them, switching them on and off and their little quirks. Next, I want you to zoom with your feet. And of course, I don't mean the zoom platform that you're watching on now, I mean the actual camera zoom. Okay, swiping and pinching. This, uh, and I recommend not using the zoom at all if you can. Zoom with your feet, bring the camera closer to you if you need a tighter shot. This will stop the degradation of quality of that digital zoom causes, which is so common on these cameras. 
So really just learn what makes your camera work best. Lastly, if you have one, more than one camera, use it. Think about multiple angles, tight and wide shots, and have some fun being creative with them. For more advanced filming, there are a range of apps available uh, that will improve the controller camera. I recommend Movie Pro, which is $9.99. It will give you a few more settings that will make it a bit more similar to the manual controls of a DSLR, if you're used to using that. Um, there's also a lot of extra equipment available that will just boost your levels a bit and just give you that little edge on production quality. So you can get an affordable LED light or a ring light for direct piece camera. And I'll show you what you, I mean by them at the end. I've got an LED light right here. So I'll give you a demonstration of how that can help. Uh, diffusing light as well is a really powerful tool. So it's a sunny day today. Uh, I've got the blinds down just blocks on the light coming in and that may cause blinds and patterns of light on people but by just putting up a bed sheet or something just through the window that will soften the light that will stop giving harsh light to people now i've got a bed sheet up to the next of me that's stopping some of that light you can see a bit of light leaking behind me in my in your corner but i'll show you at the end what i mean by a bed sheet but it is what you think it is um tripods and grip just think about how you're gonna steady your shot. Buying a cheap tripod that will just clip into your phone and it will just give you that little bit more control in framing your shots. And lastly, I want you to think about wide angle lenses. Uh, you're limited with your cameras about what you can fit into your framing. So buying an affordable snap-on wide angle lens, which you can get for about 10 pounds and they go all the way up to about 60, will just give you that bit of extra space, bit of extra space in your shot around your room so you can get some full body shots rather than being constrained as much. Okay, we're gonna have a quick look at audio. I know there's some questions about that. Quiet room. I mean, it's obvious, but think about the time of day that your room be quiet. When the bin men aren't outside, when it's not rush hour that people are going to work, so doors going in and out of the house, just find a time that's more suitable to work. With an on-camera microphone, it's best to be close to have a good level. This will make your camera's auto leveling do less work and it means you get a cleaner audio. So just make sure it's close to you. Then think about how you can block unwanted sound. I mean, it's a warm day today, so I've got the windows open, so some sound will leak in. But that bed sheet that I talked about, that I put up, that's actually baffling some of the sound and blocking the sounds coming in. So I'll show you that at the end. Again, it's what you think it is. It's a bed sheet pinned up. It's not pretty, but it does a bit of work and it creates a smaller space for me. Speak up. It seems obvious, but make sure that you can be heard, especially if you're moving away, moving around the room, then do your best for the camera mic to do less work because then it will boost the auto level and just create a bit of background noise that won't be as pretty. If you're thinking about working with multiple audio from multiple cameras, in, particularly if it's in multiple locations, I want you to think about how you're gonna sync up those separate pieces. How are you gonna match them with a start time? Visual cues can work really well for this, but it's just important to keep in mind when you're working with contributors. And lastly, a great editing tool. I was asking about stripping editing away from video earlier. A great editing tool that's a free app is called Hokusai Audio. And you can control the recording on your phone and just gives you that extra bit of tools for an edit. For it more advanced, I would think about monitoring your levels. Now the app, the Movie Pro app I mentioned earlier, gives you a bit more control in monitoring your audio levels and you can boost the gain a bit. So it just gives you that extra level of production quality. Using a microphone, then this can make a huge difference. Have a look at affordable lav or directional mics. Now a lav is a lapel mic which means you're putting close mic in person, you're pinning it, you see it on the news all the time and they pin a mic to people. These can be really affordable and they can go direct into your tablets or phones and that will just give you a little bit more control. Then a directional mic is something that only records specifically in one direction. That's one, what I'm using now and I'll just show you at the end and the way that it works. These mics can be kept for reasonable prices, and they're just all available on places like Amazon. And you don't have to spend a lot to get good quality. You can use a phone as a second recorder as well. So think about leaving that in the space as a backup 
So using, if you're recording onto one phone, maybe you just use an app like Hokusai just in the space in the room. So if you're moving away from the camera, this can just bring up more of the ambient noise. Uh, you can put a bit extra money if you have it to an external recorder. This will give you a little bit more control than using a phone and better sound quality. And it's also usually equipped with higher standard quality of microphones than just on your phone. If you're gonna have a look at audio editing, there's a program called Audacity on the desktop, which is absolutely free. I'd recommend getting that, getting to grips with it. There's loads of tutorials online, but if you're doing a major amount of audio editing, working with podcasts, I recommend having a look at that. And then there's Ferrite Recording Studio, which is also an app, which is for free just on the phones. It gives you that little bit more, <clears throat> a little bit more control and is better at multi-track editing than say Hokusai is. Uh, let's say you've got your footage together. Now we're gonna think about editing. For a beginner, it seems obvious, but get used to your camera roll. You can easily review and cut things down and this will save you so much time in importing lots of footage into your app. Sometimes apps can deal with heavy workloads, so just minimizing it down and cutting it down on your camera roll will just save that time of apps working through and considering footage. If you wanna work a little bit more difficult and get a bit more cut down, an app I recommend is InShot. It's a free and intuitive app and gives you the basics to compose a video. On a Mac, you've got iMovie. I know it's not the most glamorous, but you can do basic cut downs on there and usually basic titles just to get you going. On any other platform, I recommend OpenShot, which again is another free app, uh, another free program, I mean, and it will get you used to editing. Really just kind of getting hands on and understanding the basics of editing. It's not a frightful thing. You just need some practice to do it. If you're looking a bit more advanced, there's an app called Luma Fusion, which is $29.99. It's extremely powerful, impressive, and it will give you a bit more understanding for a low cost on understanding how timeline editing works. If you're working on a desktop, there is DaVinci Resolve, which is a professional level program. It's free, but it works differently to other um, video editing apps. So just be prepared to put a little bit more work in and also the work you may not be as applicable, but it may work better for you in understanding how that could work on your method of editing. But then there's Lightworks as well, which again is free, which will just give you that understanding of timeline and it's a fantastic editing app. Okay, I'm just gonna show you a couple of things which I've mentioned very, very quickly. So I'm gonna come out of sharing this. Excuse me. Okay, can you all see me? Okay, so what I've got here first, is a very glamorous LED light. And this one is newer and it's, this cost me 50 pounds, I think. But if I put it on, you can just see it picks me up just a little bit more from the back. Although it's not color balanced for the time of day today, which would just take a bit of work. It just means that I'm just picked out and the camera that's on my Mac has to do that little bit less work. The mic that I've been using today is very similar to a podcasting mic, but it is a directional mic. If I just lift it up into shot here, if I put it towards the camera, you'll be able to see it. And that means that I'm picking less of the ambient noise that's around me. And it's just pointing, the mic is pointing simply towards my mouth. And hopefully the aim would not be to pick up any of the road noise. I mentioned a lab mic or a lapel mic. Now you may be familiar with these. These are one of these times, this can be really hard to pick up on the camera. They're really, really tiny little things and they'll have a little clip on here and they'll just clip it onto there. And that means the level of quality, again, it's a bit different to the way a directional mic works because I'll be able to move around a bit more, particularly with this one, because this has a mini jack, as you can see here. And that means it will plug directly into my phone and therefore my phone becomes a recorder. Now, obviously a lot of uh, the later iPhones don't have inputs but there's plenty around particularly by a company called Rode that do direct into say USB-C or into Apple products. Uh, last thing I'm going to show you rather unglamorously is I'm going to just bring this in so when I said a bed sheet I did mean a bed sheet and this is on a light stand but you can just pin it to a wall 
and that is just blocking a couple of little bit of the shade and it just softens the light on the side of me. You can see how harsh the light is on the wall behind me here. It's bleaching it out, but it's just stopping that light come in just a little bit, just onto me here. Okay, there's lots of tips for you. There's lots of practical stuff. I hope that's been beneficial. Um, and just let me know if there's any questions. Brilliant, that's great. Thank you, Craig. Um, uh, just one thing, can, you, can I just ask you to spell road? You talked about a company called Road. Sure. So road is R-O-D-E. I've got the box actually here. Okay. So this is the Rode Smart Lab, but R-O-D-E. Okay. It's a fan they're company that specializes in audio for filmmakers. They've got loads of different products out there and they're one the highest end, I would say, in terms of appealing to this particular market. Road is a little bit more expensive on the line of doing audio quality, but you will notice the difference if you spend that money. But at the same point, if it's a close lav mic, you can spend as little as 10, 15 pounds and it will boost the quality of your audio. So we've had a very specific question about, um, about sound. Sure. Can you recommend a mic that will pick up a voice if the person is dancing and talking at the same time while retaining their whole body in shot. <laughs> okay, so that, what I would recommend is uh, some, one of the suggestions I gave earlier. So using your phone as a separate microphone, as a separate recorder. So buying one of these mics and plugging it into a phone and strapping it to them. Now, the thing is, if it's a live feed, then you're always gonna have a problem. The only way you could do it with a live feed is if you put a microphone into the room, a directional mic that was hanging over the top of the room. But if you're recording for, sorry. Well, I was gonna ask you what you mean by live feed. A live feed, so for live streaming online. So that means that you'd be having to go and plug directly into the live stream, into your computer streaming camera. But if you're recording for later, then I'd recommend using a separate recording device a separate phone to pin a uh, lapel mic onto and go from there. And that means you'll pick up less ambient noise. You may, if they're dancing, you'll get a bit of rustling from the clothes, which you won't be able to avoid, but it will sound clearer. Okay, lovely, thank you. Um, and so, uh, just to, uh, sort of to broaden that out really, the question is like when, when people are new to producing short form video content and, and other forms of a short form social content what are the most likely kind of problems that they will encounter what would you be advising people to look out for i would i think the, the thing that people worry about the most is something that we've discussed before which uh, rob highlighted about which is level of production quality i think that can cause people a lot of hesitation because they don't think something is high enough quality, a high enough level of production to do it. But at the moment, I would throw it out the window and just experiment. You've got a captive audience at the moment and you've got the time to try things and look for things to do. So just work with the camera that you've got and work with the mics you've got, be creative with it. And there's apps and there's tutorials online to just boost that level of quality at the moment. So just think about the equipment you've got and work it out with that. Um, I would advise uh, looking at the quirks of your camera. So that's the thing that often people get shortcomings on is understanding how auto exposure works or auto leveling or maybe auto focus because a camera looks for the brightest thing in the shot to focus on. So it's naturally gonna pick out the brighter background if, if your light is shining through the window, which is a good reason to baffle and cover the windows. So really, it's just learning about those small little quirks of your camera, the auto things. They can be a massive benefit to you, but just at the wrong moment, they can suddenly focus something in the background. They can suddenly switch off for some reason because they think they don't have to. So just learn the little quirks of auto programs on your camera. Okay. Um, and I'm going to just go into a, there's a question about adding subtitles, but just to say to people, if you've got any more of those kind of questions for Craig about um, sort of the pr practical, the production of your content, just fire, fire them in now. Um, so the question we've got about subtitles, how, how do you add subtitles? Is that sure. something you can answer? And 
also a question which you may not know the answer to, but I'll ask it because the audience might know if, if you don't. Are there any AI apps for sign language? Uh, so subtitling, um, I mean, that completely depends on the platform you're using. Um, Premiere have lots of in, uh, in program captioning and you can do it specific to what type of subtitling sub you want, whether that's burnt in subtitling or closed captioning. But really it's using the text programs inside the editor, editor that you have. There are specific ones. Um, so some of the programs I mentioned, such as OpenShot, um, they do have the ability to put subtitles and text at the bottom. Um, I would really recommend looking at the platforms like YouTube um, and uploading your video beforehand and just seeing how it uses subtitling on YouTube because they, a lot of these programs, a lot of these platforms, sorry, so YouTube and Facebook, they have closed captioning built in there and a lot of the auto generating of closed captioning is really high quality now. Of course, it's not going to be as good as someone live. It never will be. Um, but the ability to upload it and just see how that works and how you can integrate that into your workflow. For, um, sorry, it was auto-generating BSLs. Is that correct? Uh, the, the question was, are there any AI apps for sign language? Uh, not as yet. <laughs> <laughs> and I, I think it's going to be a long time before okay. they do that. But there are um, services. So there's a company called Vocwent, which I'll put up the name in the actual chat window. And um, they offer a service of doing, um, so you send over the video and they do signing against the green screen for your video. And it's, it's according to how long the video is. These people are really turned, turned around really fast because they're absolute professionals. And the idea is that you can cut out the green screen and paste it back onto your uh, video. I'll put up the link now. Thank you. And I think Katie might um, have something to add to the, uh, another comment on subtitling. Yes, can you hear me okay? Yeah, I just wanted to add something to what Craig was saying, which was um, a really useful thing to have if you're creating content and you do want to add subtitles is any kind of script um, for your video or um, anything. Make, uh, make sure you're kind of writing down what's included in your video is that will make the subtitling process um, much easier because a lot of the legwork that goes into subtitling is often the transcribing. Um, so it's worth remembering that at the start of when you're creating your short form content that actually if you can uh, have a script or um, any kind of uh, any of the dialogue written down, then um, that can be quite useful. But as Craig says, a lot of that is uh, really subtitling is normally done in the editing process. Um, uh, particularly on channels like Facebook it is worth getting it done in the edit itself. Um, captioning has become available on Facebook. So we do get asked quite a lot if, if you can just use the automatic um, captioning, but that really relies on people having it switched on on their own personal Facebook account. So it's just worth remembering that if you really do want those subtitles to appear in a, feed, a social feed, as your video begins to auto play, that really they want to be um, added in the edit process rather than on as a caption option on a platform later. Okay. Um, and there's a follow-up question in the chat, which is, does subtitling work on lyrics of songs too? Does, Martin, do you mean, do you mean automatic subtitling? Let's just see what he says. Have you, have you ever, any, either of you ever tried to subtitle the lyrics of a song <laughs> as you're going? I on? imagine it would work in the same way as, uh, as any kind of subtitling. So it's any text trying to transcribe against the content that's being seen. So if you were looking at um, uh, transcribing on YouTube, for example, there is an option where you can paste the whole of, so whether it's the lyrics or a speech or the dialogue or the interview, you can just paste the text into the transcribe box and then you can make go through and just match up, making sure that the subtitles are matching with what's being shown on the screen. Okay, lovely. Okay, so um, we've, we've a couple more sort of uh, really detailed questions and then we might broaden the discussion back out to think about some of the bigger issues. So the next um, question is, um, if back to Craig, if you are doing a participatory project and editing together a number of inputs, 
how can you get consistency across production? That's a really tough one because people are going to have different phones. People are going to have different tablets and, and also just the way the cameras deal with light. If you, even if you film it around the time of day and different noise, the thing that I would look at is creating a sort of film guidelines. So talking about where lighting should come from. So if it's always coming from the right hand side or thinking about how close microphones should be, um, it's really, I mean, it's a really tough thing to do to match cameras. So if someone's filming on a Samsung and then someone else is filming on an Apple phone from five years, you're naturally gonna have an image that looks a bit different. Um, then you are looking at things, uh, a level a production called color grading, um, which will just match colors a little bit. But really, it's learning about the cameras. It's, I know I keep going back to this, so sorry to keep replaying myself, but it's learning about the quirks and the features of your cameras. And working with a program like Movie Pro, uh, the app that I mentioned, which is available on Apple and on Android, that will give you a bit more control. And if you say to people, oh, it's got to look like this type of color because you can control the color. Um, there's a pro thing called color temperature, which I'm sure a lot of you will be aware of on cameras, which affects, this is why I'm looking a bit red now because the auto color temperature has gone a bit funny. But the more you can control that and the more you use an app like Movie Pro, that will just give you a bit more control and consistency across them. Um, the other thing as well is something I mentioned about framing. Um, so thinking about what are the constraints of the lenses on your camera, so how much space you have. Some lenses are wider on cameras. I know a lot of the more modern phones have more than one lens, which is a fantastic way to reach consistency across. So thinking of actually about the amount of space you have in your shot. So just going down the line, and really the best thing to do, I, I guess, is to get what cameras people have available to them now and try and look at the common threads through them. Some of them won't have 4K some of them will. So maybe it's just looking at the minimum specs you can work with and the common apps across these platforms and send it out as a bit of a spec sheet to your contributors. Okay, lovely. Thank you, Craig. So um, there's a question which has come in, which I'm not gonna ask you, I'm gonna throw it back to the audience if that's all right. Because somebody is saying, is there a particular phone that's especially good for film or photos? I guess, because we want, you know, there might be more than one recommendation here. This is somebody's asking as a person who needs to get a new phone. So to the audience, please, is there a, do you know of a phone you'd recommend for, for film and photos at the moment? Okay, um, I'm just going to check and make sure we've, if we've got any other detailed questions. Uh, uh, Will, hmm. there's, a, there's a question here which is interesting. So the, the person is saying, Will asking your participants to use wired Oh, I think she's, it's a follow on, isn't it? If, you, if you've got all these different people filming. We're asking your participants to use wired rather than wireless connection to improve the quality. Which is, you know, how much control do we have over the people that we work with, really? Uh, and I suppose, I'm, I'm just interested, do they mean wireless connection as in Wi-Fi or wireless as in uh, using wireless audio? Don't know. Um, I'll wait yeah. until more comes in about that. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, she's saying yes, Wi-Fi. Okay. Um, really, it's about the kind of connections in your area. I mean, the with 4G and 5G now, they can be extremely fast upload speeds, particularly on 4G. So the thing is, you may actually get a more consistent connection with 4G, but that means you have to have a clean 4G connection. So that means that you have to be close to a window, for instance, or not be part of a tower block because that will block the 4G signal a lot. So really it's about what is the upload speed. And you can check uh, upload speeds, use your uh, broadband, provi uh, broadband provider or mobile phone company. You'll be able to check your upload speeds against your actual Wi-Fi speed and do a bit of a comparison about that because that's the main thing you've got to look for is your upload speed in doing a live stream because you're sending data. I'll send, I'll post a link in the chat about um, testing broadband speeds. Fabulous. Thank you. Okay. So um, just before we go on, I'll sort of t t give you a sort of sense check of where we are. So it's half past 12 and we've got this, the webinar is going to run till one o'clock and we're going to use the rest of that time. I'll bring back all the speakers. 
and we'll just be answering questions. Some of the ones that came in before and anything that you have to add to it. Um, I'm going to keep those quite to the more sort of the general bigger questions to start with. And I'm saying that because we do have another couple of specific questions about subtitling, but I'm going to leave that to a little bit later on because I feel that um, what we want to do is sort of think about the things that are of interest to everybody rather than getting too detailed. So I've made note of the subtitling questions. We'll come back to them. But I'd just like to broaden that, um, broaden the discussion out. So we don't have any more um, talks. It's, it's now about the conversation between um, our, the audience and the speakers here today. And I'm going to start off with a question that came in before that I think really sort of uh, we've been talking a lot about you know how to create new content but this was from a choreographer specifically um, but I think it has a, a wide it has a, a wide reach uh, when we can't create new content how's the best way to repackage old content who'd like to have a stab at that one so just hold wave or if you've got if you of you three yeah, Rob Rob, what would you like to, how would you like to go with that one? Well, I'll do that. Um, yeah, I think this is a position that lots of organisations are in. Uh, choreography and dance is obviously a big one. Um, I think, uh, I mean, I've seen a few people doing this at the moment. Again, I used Birmingham Royal Ballet as an example at the moment, uh, uh, earlier on. They're doing quite a lot of things in terms of taking material that they've had potentially things that have been published in one place or another, things, the videos that might have been published to YouTube six, seven years ago. Um, they're kind of bringing those back out and publishing them on Facebook, trying them on different channels, trying them with different mechanisms that are now available that weren't available at the time. I think in each case, what they're trying to do, again, is everything we talked about before, about making sure things begin quickly. Make sure you're getting to the, the, the core of the story, really. You know, I've seen a few videos where there's lots of preamble um, and I think there is a hungry dance audience out there with a, a very, very rich appetite um, for uh, dance material. And I think it's just important just to get on with the dancing, to be perfectly honest. Um, go on, Craig. Go on, I can see you raising your hand as well. Yeah, absolutely. Um, something because um, Rob Wrench and Burn Royal Ballet, I'm doing a lot of work with them at the moment, actually doing this, repackaging their content. And the way they're kind of working in particular is they've got a very broad uh, a very broad scheme, a very broad project, and it's home from home. So the idea is that they can sort of rip, re, uh, put back out anything under that, but it still feels like it's under one umbrella. And they're doing a season of actually repurposing things and putting it back out there. Uh, something that Rob mentioned that was really good is about just getting straight into the dance. Something they've actually been doing and I've been working with them recently is they take a, a snippet out of the dance beforehand. So it may be a peak moment and that may be part of large, uh, larger five minute part of the deur or something. And they put that out maybe three days beforehand or maybe the day before the morning of. And so that actually tempts people in and they know that that's coming. And so it actually builds up interest into watching this longer piece and it kind of hits both camps there. So the people who want to see the longer part de deux piece get the whole piece and someone who just wants to see a, a really nice lift goes, oh, that's nice. I've watched five seconds of that. I think as well, it's really worth noting that I think dance and choreography has actually enjoyed an audience willingness uh, for the quality to be slightly lower, uh, far beyond COVID far before everything that we've gone through. I think dance audiences have understood that these rehearsals are happening in studios, are happening away from lights and, and live musicians and curtains and red velvet seats and all this sort of thing, uh, or studio spaces, black boxes, all that stuff. They know that these are going to be rehearsal spaces. They know that it's a privilege to be let in as well. So um, I think, yeah, in terms of quality, I think dance and choreography is actually something that's enjoyed that kind of audience buy-in and that audience exception, uh, acceptance sorry, of candidness over polish um, for a long, long time. So yeah, you should feel in a good position, hopefully. Thank you. Okay. And um, sort of carrying on really and thinking about how, what you can create for your audience. Somebody has asked, how is effective short form content achievable with a small team and little digitized material? Who'd like to take that question? I can take that one. 
Thank you. Is that, that's a, it's a really good question. And I think, again, I would go back to the idea of looking at what you have at your disposal. And if you don't have a lot of digitised material, then have a look at the simplest way to create something that's digitised. Now, I don't know what kind of um, organisation or art form you're coming from, but for instance, anything that involves the written word is probably one of your simplest things that you can create something with. So I was talking about the idea of quote images on Instagram. You see quite a lot of popular Instagram content, for example, is literally created by something typing, somebody typing something as a note on their phone and cropping it and posting it as an image. Look at anything that's image based, anything that's word based is your simplest starting point. Um, to easily digitise something that you have. So yeah, look at the simplest way to do it. Um, it may be that you don't want to start creating video as yet because that feels like too big a leap and that can be the biggest investment in terms of time um, and money. So yeah, look at um, what you have that could be converted to quite a simple digital format. Thank you. Okay. Any other thoughts, Rob? Yeah, I'm going to add to that. Um... And again, it can be a sense of voice. So I know that someone, I think it was uh, Karen Poley, I think it was, who mentioned the Cowboy Museum early on as well, which gained a lot of traction. Uh, at the National Cowboy Museum, who had twitter.com slash NCWHM. I'll post a link in the, um, uh, I'll post a link in the thread. We'll make sure this is available afterwards. But they did very, very well after they had to close down due to obviously COVID and the lockdown. And they had their security guard, Tim, who was one of the only people allowed in the building. Um, and he was going around just taking pictures of the exhibits. And he was just a very fresh and unique voice. He wasn't a curator. He didn't always know more about the items than was actually written on the cards next to them. Um, but it, yeah, it was just really fresh, really, again, credible. I know a few people have talked about credibility in the, in the comments as well. Um, he had a very kind of unique voice. Um, very, very, very simple stuff. It was just the way it was presented. Um, I know someone else has asked, uh, I think Rachel Stopler, I think, um, who was asking about, I mentioned illustrators in the comments because I know a few people here aren't from organisations and I know that when I was talking before I referred to that. That is just a, a limitation of my choice of words. It's the same with individuals as well. And so, yeah, I've got some links to illustrators who have done different things. Um, again, very, very simple, very, very straightforward, but I'll post some examples of those as well. Different levels, different styles of art, all right. Okay, um, and I just, I wanted to make a note, we keep talking about the things that we're gonna send out afterwards, but um, I was just remembering that uh, what Craig has included a document a really fantastic document that a theatre organisation have put together of free resources of, um, which might be a really good help for people with it on the small budget so again you'll, you'll get to see that in terms of um, tools and platforms and apps and things that you can use. Um, so, uh, so we're thinking really about what, what's achievable and we've also been asked um, any tips, so this is about analytics and understanding what what works and what doesn't and I think again that's something we can't go into in any detail but what what would your tips to people be in um, in terms of reviewing output to understand and learn from it what, what's really working from you so just I, I, we'll have to keep that quite short I think because it could be a whole webinar of itself anybody want to say Katie I could give a, a very, very quick tip on that, which would be if you're, there are lots of different analytics available on the different platforms, but if you, if what we're looking at is the success of short form content specifically, then I'd be looking at views and engagement and just make sure that on each of the channels, those are the ones that you're focusing on. A lot of the different social media channels will talk about reach, which maybe of some interest to you but really that's just telling you how far your content is gone has gone what you really want to know is what reaction has it had from people how many people have decided to continue to watch it so if you're looking at measuring the success of a piece of content ultimately it boils down to how many people watched this and how many people continue to watch it and um not just scroll past it and how many people um, felt compelled to react to it, which is that engagement statistic. So those would be the things I'd be looking at. And, and although reach is something that's often put at the top by social media channels, I'd argue that that's less relevant for a piece of short form content specifically. Okay, lovely. Thank you. Thank you for the lovely short answer. That's great. And a good steer in there. Um, and sort of 
on from that, there's a question about um, what works in terms of short form for companies who specialise in audience interactive work? I might ask the person who asked the question to say something more about what do they mean by audience interactive work? Are you speaking about um, the kind of work you do or, you know, is the work interactive or is it to do with reaching out to a big audience? And is it digital interactive mm. work? Is it something that you can ultimately interact with online or is it a... No, okay. a URL? There we go. The work is interactive. Any thoughts on short, how, how you would... Um, I don't know, enhance that with short form content. Go on, go on then, Rob. Um, so again, we've talked a little bit about exactly as Katie's just said, you know, one of the one of the big elements of successful short form being impact, you know, it is that engagement with the short form content that you put out. Short form content, as we said at the beginning, can be modular, shareable material. It's giving people the means to be ambassadorial about the work that you do. Um, it's giving people the opportunity to um, jump on board from a number of different sources as well. And I think if you're doing something interactive where potentially there is a bit of a learning curve for the audience in terms of how they should interact with their piece or, uh, or, or you need a little bit more context, a little bit more explaining as to what exactly your experience is and what exactly you're, um, you're getting out of it and they're getting out of it. Um, those pieces of short form that can almost act as breadcrumbs that lead towards a wider experience or lead towards a kind of deeper dive into what your piece if that's needed. So that kind of breadcrumbs approach might be useful. Again, it could be very simple written pieces of content. It can be kind of punchy, catchy headlines. It can be um, details or reports of, of how audiences have felt. You know, what's the impact of the audience been? What's the impact been on you? All of these kind of breadcrumb um, ideas, I think, are quite useful in terms of bringing people in if you've got something that is a little bit more complex. Does that make sense? It certainly does. And Craig, I thought you were something you wanted. <laughs> I was just urging. Um, something that's been really nice is uh, and a comedian called Alastair Beckett King um, did a m interactive murder mystery uh, on just on Twitter, using a Twitter thread. And that was everything from asking the audience to name the character of their detective investigating to asking and submitting questions to trying to figure out who did the murder. I'll put the link to the Twitter thread in, but the way he did it was just him on a uh, green screen background. Obviously he built up loads of assets and had some fun with that, but it was him just on the green screen so people could investigate and be interactive in that way. And he built up a whole story out of it and allowed the audience to find its way through to that. So something for, an interactive company, this might be really interesting for you. He spent ages on it. So I'm not saying go for this full scale and he had lots of graphics and stuff built, but it's just a, a maybe a starting point for you to look at things. So I'll put a link to that. And it's just, he's very funny. So it's just worth spending your time just having a look at that. Brilliant, thank you. Okay, so I'm gonna sort of shift it a little bit. There's, um, there's two areas we're gonna look at. First is we have been, uh, we've got a few questions around finding audiences. Um, and so I'll come to that first, but the second thing, just to bear in mind, is that the second area that people are speaking about now that we'll come to is the uh, looking at sort of uh, money, business models and donations. So we'll do audiences first and then we'll think about that. So the questions we've been asked are, you know, how, how do you cut? In fact, the, the, the question we were asked most often beforehand was about cutting. How do you cut through to a new audience? And that seems to be in terms of you know, it's a bit like the magic wand again, isn't it? What is the magic? What really cuts through? And how do you find new audiences beyond the people who are already your supporters? Who'd like to start on that one? I'm happy to start on that one if that's... Thanks, Katie. Yes, please. Uh, Craig and Rob are happy. So I think, firstly, it's worth saying that I think this was starting to get into this distribution territory, which I know is covered in another webinar. So I'll try and keep it um away from the, the content that'll be covered in that webinar but really i think it, i just want to make the point about going back to um when you're looking at creating your short form content the way to cut through to new audiences is to try and focus on those stories that somebody would be interested in even if they'd never heard of you before because if you're creating something like that that means that your friends and followers and fans will be more compelled to share it 
um, because it's got more of a universal theme and they think that their friends and family would be interested in it as well. And that is ultimately what the most shareable content is, is stories that become interesting quite universally, whether they're specifically about you or not. So it's really looking for those universally interesting themes that become quite shareable. And then you're kind of looking at a mixture of how do we lean into our networks and our the partners and the people we know and our followers and the people who are following us on these platforms to help us cut through and actually amplify the content when we're posting it. Lovely, thank you. Does anybody else have anything they want to add to that in terms of reaching out beyond audiences? I'm all right. Okay, thank I you. Think, yeah, I think Katie's nailed it. It's about making that content shareable. You know, it's, uh, yeah, yeah. Because one of the questions was asking about, you know, can we use, persons wondering about things like hashtags and tagging people and so on. Is that a way that you could build new audiences or reach out beyond who you know? I think hashtagging can be really useful. Um, I think one thing it's it's worth trying to clarify between what we're looking at here and where hashtagging is particularly useful if it, but it can be quite a slow burn in terms of building up followers and people that are going to engage with you. So for instance, if you were looking at a hashtagging strategy on Instagram, then you'd be looking at posting quite a lot of content over a long period of time against that hashtag to enable to build up those followers who would associate you with that kind of content. When we're looking at the success of a series of short form content on channels, you are probably more likely to get success by leaning into partners and networks and other publishers on those channels to help amplify your content and push it out further. Um, and that's the strategy we often follow at the space um, rather than just going for hashtags. When, when you're talking about tagging people, I'm assuming and stop and correct me if I'm wrong, that you're looking at tagging people who you think might be inter interested in it, who are likely to share. And actually what I would suggest is looking at taking that off the channel and doing that behind the scenes and doing that work in advance. So letting people know that you've got a great new piece of content that's going out next week. And just to keep reminding them that it's there instead of doing it on the front end where you can get a slight tumbleweed effect if you've tagged lots of people and nobody's responding, it's much better to have those conversations offline and you are actually more likely um, to get people's support in that way to really help push your content out further. Fab. And as you said, we're sort of, you know, we're sort of thinking about almost into the territory of distribution, aren't we? And when we do the next distribution webinar, there'll be quite a lot of looking at um, the different platforms you could so part of it's understanding the audience and also understanding platforms and that's we'll cover that in a separate session okay thank you for that then katie so can we come to the question of uh, fundraising really and it started with somebody saying how best can you encourage people to donate to you on social and do you have any good examples of where the content has encouraged this and i guess that i'm again i'm going to throw this to katie but Again, it's, it would be useful amongst the audience if you've seen any success stories in terms of raising money via donations, let everybody know about them because it's so useful. But Katie, you said you'd have some comment on this. Yeah, I, I would answer this. Um, I mean, initially, in terms of good examples, I would definitely look at some of the major charities, uh, look at their Facebook and Twitter accounts and look at some of the short form content that they create. Um, for ideas of best practice in that area of because again what they lead with is stories and that is essentially what you need is a story that's going to um, elicit an emotive response from somebody that's going to make them take action that's ultimately what you're looking for but I also just wanted to answer this from a kind of content planning point of view because there's a really crucial thing around balancing your asks from the audience with your gifts to the audience so if all you do on Facebook or Twitter or Instagram is post things that say donate, 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 buy a ticket, donate, you very quickly turn off your audience. And actually what you need to do is balance um, the gifts that you give the audience, which for instance could be um, an interesting video about the construction of a venue without asking the audience to do anything other than just enjoy the content you're going to engage them far more. So you're far better planning your content. So you're posting three interesting stories about the cause that you're trying to raise money for 
and then at the end of that after that almost separately saying by the way did you know this was under threat please can you support us that's a far more effective content planning strategy than attaching a donation ask to every piece of content you put out in my opinion i'm not a fundraiser i'm looking at it purely from a content planning point of view and what is an, a kind of audience experience point of view um, somebody who's a fundraiser may have a different take on that but that would be my take to just make sure you're getting that balance okay thank you very much i'm going to add to that as well because um it may be again we're in a kind of very unique time so it may be that you as an individual or an organization have often felt unable to ask you know unable to say you know please donate um those kind of additional asks of audiences i think when we've done podcast projects where you need people to leave a review or a social video where you need someone to like or share a, a, a you know a youtube clip where you need someone to subscribe you know all of these different things um i think if there's a very clear ask and i think if exactly as katie says you have offered value in what it is that you've offered to someone um, you know, you can say, please like and, and hit the donate button or, or, you know, whatever you want it to be. I think, um, yeah, as long as you're matching a, a fair ask with a fair offering, um, you can really feel able to do that. And again, I think at the moment, uh, everyone knows that a lot of individuals, a lot of organisations, um, a lot of, of companies are struggling at the moment and that they do need to secure income um, for themselves and for anyone that works there. So... Yeah, it's it's a, a very reasonable ask at the moment. It's very reasonable for you to say, you know, please hit the donate button and support us if you can. Again, as long as as long as you've offered something. Yeah. Lovely. Thank you. Thank you very much. And then, so the next thing I wanted to move into again was asked in advance, and it's but we're a bit back to the question of subtitling comes into this. But please, just any thoughts on making short form content wholly accessible? for a variety of needs. So they're talking about captioning, audio description, but, but really broadly, what, what, what are your thoughts or tips on making your content accessible to all audiences? Anybody like to go on that one? Craig? Yeah, um, I would think about it as much, I would think about it as importantly as the rest of the content you're gonna make. So if you're thinking about planning of where it's going to go, uh, think about how important, how you're going to work with being subtitling or captioning and how you're going to work with, if there's going to be a BSL interpreter, how are you going to include that in part of your shot, in part of your planning and actual using the space and the editing? It I mean, uh, you know, I hammered home planning in, in my talk and it is so important. And particularly if you're including these things as an important part of your actual finished content piece think about how these are going to be included in your final product. A lot of these platforms, they are still behind on, on the way you uh, put in accessibility, the way things work. I mean, YouTube is very good on its auto generation and you can go in and put in subtitles, uh, captions, as Katie mentioned. And something that's quite interesting actually is, which I haven't seen a lot of people use is on Twitch. So Twitch, you, you can work with a lot of different systems that works with live streaming and overlaying different video layers. Um, it's actually working with a lot of uh, third-party softwares to then create a stream that you put onto Twitch. But a lot of gamers, they'll put themselves in the corner down here as they're playing the game. And you could absolutely do that with a BSL subtitle, you know, a BSL interpreter very easily so just thinking but then you would have to think about okay well is that actually going to conflict with anything that's happening in my shot i need to keep action away from that corner or if there's subtitling going across how is that going to work with the bsl interpreter because if i'm putting in hard subtitles are they going to clash and are they going to be over the top of each other so it's really about putting in that planning about thinking about how you were going to include it into your actual content and looking at the ways that new streams, so like I talked about Twitch, how they, they can actually work to your benefit. Look at the way gamers are using these channels and try and use that as a way for accessibility. Thank you. Can, can I ask a follow on question, which is from earlier? Somebody saying, which is, if you know, thinking about planning, which is preferable, creating burned in subtitle, subtitles or closed captions that can be switched off and on? 
it's about where it's going to go and what's it for. I mean, yeah. uh, actual burnt in subtitles, they're good for gain, like getting attention, getting people's recognition. But, and so if you look at the examples from BBC three that uh, Katie used, they're great because they get people's attention straight away and you can tell a bit of the story and use it as a promotional aspect, but the same content is not going to be on the longer form. So they're samples from shows they're not going to be there on the longer form version. So really it's about what's this for and who it's for and making, I'd say think about making it accessible as possible. So actually using the, um, the closed caption technology that's on the platforms and making sure that you have transcriptions and that the transcriptions are accurate and you're matching up the time to them. Um, so yeah, it's, it's, it's about what you want it for and, I'd say burnt in subtitles, although they're, although they're very useful, they're often used as more of a promotional and gaining people's attention to more than anything else. Thank you. Uh, Just before we move on, Rob, we've only got, we've got three minutes left. So I think we're going to finish with, by thinking about accessibility, but that's fine. We've got three minutes. So if you've just got a quick point to make, please. And then. Yeah, it was just to say, um, the sort of accessibility with a big A and a small A. So you'll often find the materials posted on platforms like, Facebook, Instagram, and so forth have got burnt in subtitles because most people who are viewing the materials on there don't have headphones plugged in, aren't listening to the sound, even if you know, even if they'd be able to. Um, and so it's there exactly as Craig says as a promotional thing to catch people's eye. If you're using subtitles put in as a file, that's easier for Google to read. You know, that's easier for for um, for browsers and searches to actually find. So it's about kind of where that information is locked up. But again, we talked about using your research, using your creation across multiple formats. So it may be that actually trying to have one golden piece of content that, that does everything for everyone um, is one approach. It might actually be that you can just post a podcast plus a transcription and there's, there's two different bites of the cherry there. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, and again, another plug for the links that we send out afterwards, which include a, a really new article about how to make your work really accessible. So I have lots more information in it. And that I think is a good place to stop. We've covered all the questions that were asked. Um, I wanted to say thank you to you as an audience. I haven't, I've just been seeing that there's been amazing conversations going on in the chat, which is fabulous. It's really good. And thank you so much for all your contributions and ideas and willingness to share. And the same to our speakers. Thank you very much for all your time and your thoughtfulness and generosity in sharing your knowledge. So um, we've, uh, again, with the next, the next webinar we're doing is on the 10th of June and that's around digital rights. And other than that, please fill in the evaluation and we hope to see you again soon. And thank you once again, everybody. And that's it. Finished. Bye bye. <laughs>